miracles because I believe in God. And I believe in the person and the power of God Almighty with every atom of my being. Well, sir, today I'm going to talk to you about the person and the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you want to know something? Theoretically, tens of thousands of people honor the Holy Spirit every Sunday morning when they sing the doxology in their places of worship. And yet, there are thousands who know absolutely nothing about the person of the Holy Spirit. They know absolutely nothing about the power of the Holy Spirit. You would be amazed how many folk sing the doxology every Sunday morning when they attend their place of worship. And yet, whenever they think of the Holy Spirit, they think of him as just an influence or perhaps one of the attributes knowing nothing about this wonderful person who is literally the power of the Trinity. And then, of course, there are those who are just beginning to become acquainted with this glorious personality. And they feel as though they've just discovered a new thing. This wonderful new personality who has just come on the scene. They feel as though they have made a marvelous discovery. A person who has never really been active in power before. And yet, do you want to know something? The Holy Spirit. This wonderful third person, the Trinity, has existed since eternity. And it's just like that. You go back to the beginning of time. Go back, if you will, please. When the great plan of salvation was laid out, me thinks the three were at that great conference table, and I like to think of it as the greatest conference table that the world has ever known. And the three were present. How do I know? Because at that time, when they were laying out the plan, for man's salvation, for your redemption, for my redemption. Jesus offered himself through the Holy Spirit to God the Father to be given. Oh, I know, as a little child in Sunday school, the very first scripture you learned was John 3:16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But beloved, before God could give his son, Jesus, the son of the living God, offered himself through the Holy Spirit to be given by the Father. They were all three there. You cannot separate the Son from the Father, neither can you separate the Father from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God, Jesus Christ is God, and God the Father is God. All three have existed from eternity. And Jesus at that great conference table said, all right, I'll go. I'll become as much man as though I was not deity and divinity. 
I'll go. I'll take the form of flesh. And turning to the Holy Spirit, and knowing the matchless power of the Holy Spirit, he said, I'll go. Knowing your power, I'll depend on you for that glorious power of service. And he offered himself, the word of God says, through the Holy Spirit to be given to the Father. And the Father gave his only begotten Son. If only our poor little puny minds could fathom all that was involved when they laid the plans for man's redemption. And Father God, knowing his only begotten Son, trusted in him, knowing, knowing that he would be true to that trust. And Jesus came. This is something so very thrilling. Through it all, watch the Holy Spirit and the involvement of the Holy Spirit. The very first that we have of the Holy Spirit, this wonderful personality, this glorious power of the Trinity, taking this active part in redemption's plan is recorded in the first chapter of Matthew. Here it is. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. That which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. All of this was in God's wonderful redemptive plan. It was just the body of Mary, the physical body of Mary, that encompassed that remarkable thing, that great miracle conceived of the Holy a little further, something that I think is most thrilling. It's recorded in the third chapter of Matthew. It's at that hour when Jesus comes out of the waters of baptism. Oh, I have read it. I have wept over it. The pages of my Bible are worn and torn. It's so precious to me. And Jesus, when he was baptized, get it, he is now coming up out of the waters of baptism. Went straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And low voice from heaven saying, This is 
my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Again, we have the three persons united. The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, the three who sat at this great conference table and mapped out the wonderful plan of redemption the wonderful plan of man's salvation. Again, they are reunited. The first time that we see the three together, since Jesus offered himself to the Holy Spirit, to God the Father to be given for man's redemption. And in this moment, coming up out of the waters of baptism, we see the Holy Spirit, the glorious power of the Trinity, descending upon Jesus, equipping him for a very definite purpose, for there was a great ministry ahead. There was a marvelous ministry ahead. And things were running on schedule, even as they had planned. And the Holy Spirit descending upon Jesus, equipping him with power for service. And in that same moment, a voice. Whether anyone heard of that voice except the Son, I do not know. It was the voice of God himself saying this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased follow me very closely remember something when Jesus came he was as much man as though he were not God. It had to be so. For he has known every temptation that any human being has ever known. He could not be a rightful judge. And one day, he will be our judge. He'll be your judge. One day, when life is all over, and we stand in his glorious presence. Jesus is the one who's going to be your judge. He's going to be my judge. And how could he be a righteous judge? Had he not suffered the same temptations that you have suffered, the same temptations that I have suffered. And that's the reason I say to you those temptations were real. Don't let anybody tell you that those temptations were not real that Jesus suffered. When the enemy of his soul came to him, when the evil one, when the devil came with those temptations, those temptations were real and he could have yielded to those temptations. Had he not been able to yield to those temptations, then they would have been a both the devil knew and Jesus knew that he could have yielded to those temptations for he was as much man as though he were not God and as much God as though he were not man here is something that's marvelous the hour came for service. The father was trusting his son to carry through. The Holy Spirit came through as planned. We talk about the wonderful miracles in the ministry of Jesus. We thrill to those glorious ministries that Jesus had, but watch. There is a secret that has been overlooked. The secret 
of the power in the life of Jesus was found in the person of the Holy Spirit. Read, if you will, please. In the ninth chapter of Acts, you know, you've taken this precious book. It's been on your shelf, lo, these many years. Why don't you get it out and read it? It's one thing, you know, to have me to read these things to you. But it's another thing for you to have your own Bible. This is the very word of God. Before Jesus performed any miracle whatsoever, something happened. And this was the secret of the power in the earthly ministry of Jesus. And the secret is found in this 38th verse. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost. And with power, who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. What was the secret of power in the ministry of Jesus? These miracles that Jesus did while he walked this earth. He knew. Jesus knew the secret of his power. It was no mystery to him. When he came up out of the waters of baptism, the Holy Spirit descended upon him. He was filled with the glorious power of the Holy Spirit. Then followed a matchless ministry. And the word tells us that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he knew the secret of that power. Jesus talked very confidentially to his own one day. It's recorded in John. He said, you know, I'm going away. It is expedient for you, it is necessary for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Holy Spirit will not come unto you. And when he is come, he will magnify me. He has great power, convicting power. He'll convict the world of sin and of judgment to come. He talked very freely of a personality, not just an influence, not just one of the attributes, but of a personality constantly referring to him. He shall convict the world of sin and of judgment to come. He will magnify me. The Holy Spirit, a definite person with a very definite personality. So important was the coming of the Holy Spirit Go back and read it in your own precious word. He's about to leave now. He's standing there. He's going away. He knew the fickleness of human beings. Jesus knew. of men and women. He understood, he knew. But he also knew the power of the person, the Holy Spirit. 
and his very last words, knowing that he was leaving a few men and women with his wonderful task, his unfinished task, the last words that he said before he went away, and ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. The same wonderful power that you've seen manifested in my ministry, this wonderful demonstration of power that you've seen with your own eyes, you've seen, you've experienced, I want you to know that I'm leaving you, not alone, but when I am gone, I'm going to send him to you, this same wonderful third person of Trinity, this same wonderful power of the Trinity. I'm going to send him, this person who's been the secret of the power in my life and my ministry. Ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. He came. Oh, in that upper room, live it and read it. I have a thousand times over in the second chapter of Acts. It was even as Jesus said it would be. He has never given us an untruth, never. And then that upper room, something happened. Things are still going on schedule and we know that Jesus made it back to the Father's throne. We know that Jesus is at this very moment in position of great high priest. We know that he's at the right hand of God the Father. He made it back to glory because he said when he arrived, he would send the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit came. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. The same Holy Spirit who descended upon Jesus as he came up out of the waters of baptism came upon those believers in that upper room. Power for what purpose? Why was the Holy Spirit given? For one purpose and one purpose only. For service. for service. You and I are saved to serve. Not one of us ought to live a defeated Christian life, not for one moment. He's made ample provision for power. He has made ample provision for victory. through the person of the Holy Spirit. Everything that Jesus had as he walked to the shores of Galilee is ours today. He made that provision. Everything they had in the early church is ours today. And that is what Zechariah meant when he cried forth, it's not by might, 
It's not by power, but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord. Watch, beloved, what we need in our churches today is not more organization. What we need is not bigger and better church edifices. What we need is not more and better learned men behind our pulpits. What we need in our churches today is the power of the Holy Spirit. What you as a Christian need in that life of yours this hour is the power of the Holy Spirit. For it's the Holy Spirit alone who'll give the results. Father God, please, Teach us regarding this wonderful third person, the Trinity, and give us that power in the pulpit, in our churches, and in our individual lives for Jesus' sake. Pastor Benny Hinn often talks about how Catherine Coleman's life and ministry impacted his own development as a young preacher of the gospel and how attending her services led him into a deep and intimate knowledge of the Holy Spirit. Pastor Benny has made a special arrangement with the Catherine Coleman Foundation in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania for permission to air selected episodes of I Believe in Miracles, Miss Coleman's television program from the 1960s and 70s. But now let's join Miss Coleman during a program originally recorded in 1969 as she teaches on the budding of the fig tree. The Lord showed to Jeremiah two baskets of figs. And that's the first time that we have the sign of the figs in the Old Testament. Now, the Lord God had a reason for doing it. This is what he showed to Jeremiah. One basket had very good figs, even like the figs that are first ripe. The other basket had very naughty figs, which could not be eaten. They were so bad. Then said the Lord unto me, What seest thou, Jeremiah? And I said, Figs. There was no mistaking. Figs. Sure. The good figs, the very good, and the evil, very evil, that cannot be eaten, they're so evil. And here, I want you to understand something, watch it. Here is again the picture of Israel. Only watch the psychology that God used in this. He first gave us the picture of the good things that's so like you. Ha uh ha. -huh. The positive, the good things. And then after the good things, the bad things, the evil things. And in the picture of the evil things, we see Israel in her time of apostasy. During that time when God could not look upon her sin of unbelief. Watch it. This is thrilling. And again the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, like these good figs, so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah, whom I have sent out of this place in the land of the Chaldeans for their good. 
I will set mine eyes upon them for good. I will bring them again to the land. I will build them and not pull them down. I will plant them and not pluck them up. I will give them an heart to know me that I am the Lord and they shall be my people and I will be their God for they shall return unto me with their whole hearts. Watch. I will deliver them to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth for their hurt. He's turning now to the evil figs, the naughty figs, the disobedient children of Israel. I will deliver them to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth for their hurt, to be reproach and a proverb, a taunt, a curse in all places whither I have dry them. I will send the sword, the famine, and the pestilence among them till they be consumed from off the land that I gave unto them and to their fathers. Now, I've given you the Old Testament. The picture of disobedient Israel. The Jews scattered to the four corners of the earth. We see them desolate. They're suffering. Their years of persecution. But again the Lord said, I will, I will. I will restore them, and they will. They will accept me with their whole heart. All right, hold that just a minute. Go back, if you will, please, to that wonderful portion of the Word of God that I've given you over and over again. When on the Mount of Olives, the disciples asked for a sign of the time when we have the end of the Gentiles returning again to Israel in their land, their promised land. And again he gave the fig tree. Oh, sure it's there. He gave that parable. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender, you know it. Hold it just a minute. Now, Go, if you will, please, to that familiar portion in the 11th chapter of Mark when Jesus cursed the fig tree. You know it. I'll read it to you. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. And when he had looked round about upon all things, and now the eventide was come, he went out unto Bethany with the twelve. Sure, I'm talking to folk who have walked that distance, even as I have. It isn't a long walk. Just visualize Jesus with his disciples walking it. One evening, they had been in the temple in Jerusalem it was now getting dark, and slowly they walked into Bethany. And on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry, which was not unusual. And seeing a fig tree afar off, having leaves, he came, if haply he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. But that, my friend, is not the end of the story. Oh, sure, every minister who has ever stood in this pulpit has a sermon on the cursing the fig tree. Sure. When Jesus, being hungry, 
came to the fig tree, he found that it had no fruit on it whatsoever, only leaves. He cursed it. Religion is one thing. With just religion, there'll be no spiritual fruit, none whatsoever. But go a little further. This is not the end of it. You do not find the secret of the cursing the fig tree unless you read the 20th verse of the same chapter. And in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up. But don't stop there. For years, we have just stopped there. The fact that Jesus had cursed the fig tree. And the next day when they passed by, they saw that that fig tree that had been cursed was now dried up. And we've left it there. Don't do it. That's the way so many folks read the Word of God. Continue for the next three words of the secrets to this glorious, wonderful thing that Jesus did. I read it in its entirety. In the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. It was only cursed from the roots The life of that fig tree was in the roots. When Jesus cursed it, all that was cursed was that which could be seen visibly. That's all. There was no curse up on the roots whatsoever. Life remained in the roots. Watch it now. When the disciples asked Jesus, as they sat together on the Mount of Olives, what shall be a sign? How will folk know, living in that generation, how will they know the time when the Holy Spirit is about to leave? When will they know when they're coming to the end of the time of the Gentiles? When will they know the time of the return of the Lord back to earth again? Surely they will have a sign. You've always given them a sign. Always. What master will be the sign? And this is why he answered. Watch it. You have no understanding of what he was talking about unless you fully understand the cursing of the fig tree. He goes back. Learn a parable of the fig tree, the same fig tree. When his branch is yet tender. Think how many generations have come and gone. Think of the centuries that have passed into history. And the fig tree seemingly remained cursed. The Jews are people without a country. Literally, not thousands, but millions of them. Killed, hated. A nation without a country, a people without a haven. The suffering. Only God knows the suffering that they have gone through generation after generation because of their unbelief, because of their apostasy. Why this terrific judgment? Why this terrific chastisement? Because, my friend, of the blessing of God prior to this judgment. God had blessed them with blessings that he had never and has never given.
to a people. I see him in his tender mercy, his long suffering, blessing them over and over and over again. Oh, the light that Jehovah God had given to them, the protection that Jehovah God had given to them. Now I want to stop right here and say to you, be careful. You who've had the light, you who have been called, you who know the word of truth, you who have had the knowledge of the word, you who know what it's all about, You've tasted it. I'm not telling you anything that you do not know. When I say to you, you've tasted of the things of God. You've tasted of the blessings of God. You know, I don't have to tell you. There is a place in him where his presence is so wonderful. But remember something. To stay in that place is a life without a compromise. And the minute you compromise, and the minute you become disobedient unto him, that blessing lips and you're asking for trouble. There'll be sorrow, there'll be heartache, as sure as you live and breathe, because you've known, because you've tasted. And God had to chastise the children of Israel for their disobedience. And he turned from the Jew to the Gentile. He's coming back now again to keep all of those covenants. And slowly but surely, that fig tree that was cursed from the roots up, but all through those years of chastisement, there was still life in those roots. That life never died. Never. Never. Jesus said, you want a sign? All right, I'll give it to you. And this is what he said. Learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, that branch of Israel is very tender very tender, so young a nation, so tender, but those leaves are coming forth and put forth leaves. The leaves, my friend, are on the fig tree. They're there. And God is beginning to keep his earthly covenants to an earthly people. Things are happening very quickly, very quickly, very rapidly. Things that perhaps you do not understand. There's only one today who fully understands what's taking place. That's the Christian. That's God's children because he knows the word. I want to say just now, I pray to God that he'll give you judgment day honesty. The only place in the whole world today where you'll find real peace is in the heart of a man or a woman, whether he be Jew or Gentile, regardless of nationality. The only place where you'll find real peace from here on out, 
will be in the heart of a man or a woman who's been born again. For I cannot give you a beautiful picture of the future, knowing God's word as I do. We can kid ourselves and say that things are getting better. We can kid ourselves, hopefully saying things will be better. But knowing the word of God, it's getting darker and darker. We're nearing the midnight hour. How do I know? When you see these things begin to come to pass, know that it is nigh even at the very door. In this moment, and it only takes a moment for this wonderful transaction. I beg of you before it's too late. Before it's too late. Do the thing that's most important to you now. Accept him as your savior. And now, wonderful Jesus, this very moment, that transaction in that life, in that heart, when old things pass away and behold, all things become new. As your own Holy Spirit puts its seal upon that transaction, thanks. God's Word lives and abides forever. Today you heard a powerful message by Catherine Kuhlman. As you know, her foundation has allowed us to air some of her programs, and I want to pray with you right now. I'm asking God today to anoint your life and to prepare you for the coming of His precious Son, Jesus. And then I'm going to pray that the Lord will heal you today and set you free. Now, precious Lord, I thank you for your word and your promises. And I do pray today, anoint everyone watching this program. Prepare each one for your blessed coming. Your word declares unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us before the throne with joy. Granted, I pray that we all be strengthened today and on that day be blameless for your glory. And now, precious Lord, heal that one calling on your name. Bring health and strength. Remove that sickness. Drive away that disease. In your precious and glorious name, amen and amen. Serve an awesome Lord. You've just seen a classic of Catherine Kuhlman from her daily programs that we aired years ago. I wanted to show it to you again today because I believe we need the Word of God that she preached so powerfully. And again, thank you for being my wonderful partner and friend. And I want to pray with you right now that God will bless you for your support, for supporting the ministry. And I'm going to ask you also to give that we can continue finishing the digitizing of all those wonderful old messages, not only of our own meetings and crusades, but also of others like Miss Kuhlman. And the Lord will bless you for that because our children need to see these. Our grandchildren need to see these. I just came back from Colorado Springs. I'm on my way to Canada, in fact, uh, tomorrow. And I'm just so amazed to see the hunger today in the young people. I had the youth come down in one of the meetings, and half the audience were young people. Thousands of people there, and half of them young people. And I hear the same thing will be so in Canada. I'll be ministering to a lot of youth in Canada. So this is the upcoming future generation that needs to see these programs that have touched millions. Let's do it together for the Lord, please. And wonderful Jesus, I thank you, for Lord, 
for blessing your people, even now, Lord, financially. I pray you'll prosper them. Increase them on every side. Bless the work of their hands. Wonderful Jesus. And Lord, thank you for the privilege that you've given us to serve you and give to your work. And to you be all the glory. And God's people said, Amen and Amen. Thank you again for watching. We'll show you these special classics every so often. But again, tomorrow, a very powerful program on the Lord Jesus revealed in the Gospel of John. You don't want to miss tomorrow. But go ahead and give right now to the Lord's work. You can give on the platform you're watching me on or go to our website, benahim.org, or simply text BHM45777. And thank you again for your love and your support. I'll see you tomorrow. Benningham Ministries has stayed on the cutting edge for the past five decades, making the move from analog television to digital broadcasts, HDTV, the internet, streaming live events, and social media. Today's fast-changing, bold new world brings an entirely new set of challenges. What we did in 1974 when this ministry began, or in 2000, or even 2022, will not be effective in 2023. And who knows what 2024 and beyond will bring. Benny Hens Ministry has been at the forefront of each innovation that provides a better way of taking the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world more effectively and efficiently. Today, more than ever before, we stand on the edge of a bold new world. From the beginning, the Lord made it clear that keeping and storing all archives and resources should be a top priority. This is a new hour. This is the Joshua generation. Now I want to tell you something. The first thing God said to Moses is go down. The first thing he said to Joshua is arise. We're not a people who are going down. We are the ones who are rising up. Even with controlled temperature storage facilities, time has been the enemy. Tape warping, decay, housing detachments, cracks, shredding, and breakdowns happen. Older tapes break, disintegrate, and require surgical type methods of restoration. Thus far, we've rescued and digitized 10,500 of the 13,437 tapes from the past half century. To God be the glory. A conservative estimate to finish this digitation process is a million dollars to restore the final 30% of these disintegrating tapes and move everything over to a much more permanent digital format. The project, already started, can be completed fairly quickly. Imagine, if you will, what could happen if all of our digitized material could be used to translate everything into every language on Earth. It is possible. Even better, how exciting would it be to translate these materials using the same voice as originally spoken, yet in all of the different dialects around the world? Pastor Benny speaks several languages, but imagine if his teachings became available online with him speaking in Swahili, Mandarin, Portuguese, Belarusian, or Cherokee. This amazing AI tool will be useful around the world. Pastor Benny's legacy, life's work, calling, and anointing will be preserved for generations yet to come until the Lord returns. And with artificial intelligence tools that can translate all of the digitized materials into languages around the world, we can truly fulfill our Lord's Great Commission. Nearly 50 years ago, this great adventure known as Benny Hen Ministries began with one voice.